offer these videos to the grander independent investor audience really like looking to uh, strike up a discussion around the value proposition uh, with a company like Kylie on I want to discuss how I feel like uh, some of the questions that I've been posed with, you know, is going green worth it? And in short, no, it's not. Okay, fleets have been looking to go green for quite some time. And there has to be certain value propositions in place for that hard no that's been on the books now for many, many years. I think this discussion about uh, going uh, full electric, electrifying the fleets has been a discussion for a long, long time. And up until now here, as of late with the uh, lack of technology uh, on the marketplace, that no has been uh, really an, an easy answer for uh, the fleets out there with the technology and the value proposition that is placed forward uh, by the companies that uh, are, are, are acting in the space. And I think when you look at it from a standalone perspective and you, you ask yourself, you know, what, what am I investing in in Hylion? Is it, is it the green initiative? Um, is it to save the planet? Um, although I do believe that Hylion's strategic goal to change the world um, is, a, is a valuable one. I believe even Hylion believes and the bulls that hold shares in Hylion also understand that if they are going to change the world and realize this goal of electrifying the fleets, that they are going to do so with certain conditions that are going to be met. And I don't think that these are talked about very often across the Hylion community. I know at times we dabble with these. And you know, if you were to ask a, a Hylion uh, uh, bull out there, they probably remembered this at some point in why they invested in the company. And it seems to get a little bit easier to forget those value propositions when you've got a share price that is hovering at around the $6.75 range. It's easy to do. It's our human nature to allow ourselves uh, to forget those things and start to really question why it is that we put so much stock, no pun intended, in the value proposition uh, with Hylion. And it's easy, actually, as a target in the short term to erode away at some of those value proposition plays. But here's the thing. It really is just a glaze over if the bears are looking to exploit Hylion Holdings as something other than having an extreme value proposition in their portfolio of checkboxes that they can provide to industry in putting forward a viable solution that can actually electrify the fleets and actually uh, contribute to the bottom line back to the fleets. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the value proposition with Hylion Holdings. The first thing is the cost of RNG. Now, the, this is a really tough one because fuel prices, they fluctuate up and down. Okay. Right now, RNG is anywhere between on the low end, half of the cost of diesel or as little as uh, one third. Uh, the cost of RNG. So, so it does fluctuate in that uh, realm based on the administration that comes in. Usually a, a democratic agenda would probably, and it's being shown right now under the Biden administration, um, that, that diesel has come up a little bit, okay, in, in its value. Uh, conversely, if we do get another administration in like a Republican driven uh, agenda, perhaps maybe that those fuel costs would come down because, um, you know, one is more apt to drill. But we, when we look at the RNG opportunity, okay, we look at the value proposition and we compare what you could potentially get on a seven year total cost of ownership. And, and this is the metric that I've seen. And I really want you guys to ground truth this for yourself. If the metric is as high as 10 years, obviously these value propositions exponentially increase. But what I have seen off of the value proposals made uh, 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 available through Hylion um, is a seven year total cost of ownership. So I would assume that that's in line with the discussions that they're having with industry when they sit down and they look to map out a, a potential per unit 
uh, cost uh, of ownership over that uh, same time period. So what do we have right now on the market? We have right now a diesel truck that is actually very inexpensive, okay? When you initially go buy uh, a diesel truck, really what you can expect is is an uh, upfront cost of around 100, just over $130,000, okay? And what, what ends up getting missed all the time is that the cost of the fuel over the life of that seven years is actually going to cost you more than double what the initial cost of the truck is. So you, you want to ask, what is the benefit of going green? Why wouldn't I just stay with diesel? Okay. Initially, you get the oomph, you get the horsepower, you get all of the benefits of diesel, the reliability. Diesel engines have been reliable for the last hundred years. Okay. They've been a phenomenal uh, power source of, of moving our transportation uh, goods uh, across this country and abroad globally. Okay. But, but the real kicker is uh, the close to $300,000 estimated fuel cost over the seven year period. Now, when you add that to the initial cost of the truck, you're talking about just over $430,000 per unit. Um, on the diesel side of the house. So when you say, well, we could look at the the prospects of just staying with diesel and that the value to the bottom line just isn't there if I was going to transition to the Hylion product, specifically the Hypertruck ERX, that it's not worth it. Perhaps maybe standalone, it might not be. Look at it from the fleet's perspective. They've been working off of diesel for decades and decades. And so the mindset has to be such that the bottom line has to be drastically improved to move away from the reliability to the prospects of a new technology that could potentially add tens of thousands to the bottom line and also look to augment that reliability that they've become accustomed to over the decades. You see the push-pull here. And that's why the easy answer uh, up to this point here, which I feel like is different. It, it, there's a feeling about this uh, that's different. I, I'm not a, a green initiative uh, type of fella. I think that there's things that we could do to improve the planet. I'm a steward of the planet myself individually, a drop in the bucket, yes. But I do contend that these larger companies do actually have an obligation to go green. And it has been there. Um, their uh, conveniently uh, uh, convenient position to actually say no to anything to green because of moving away from the reliability and not having the bottom line substantiation on um, the the the, the uh, total cost of ownership of any of the new technology that's being brought to bear, and I think that's where Hylion really changes the game. And and here's why. Thomas Healy has talked about the initial onset cost being a little bit more for the unit. Is it, is it worth it? You know, on the back end on a diesel truck, you're going to end up spending $300,000 on the fuel to run that unit over the life of that unit, assuming that the life of that unit is due for a rotation after seven years, $300,000. So the value proposition with Hylion is to make an onset, uh, an initial onset investment in the technology cost you just shy of around $100,000 more than the 137,000 or so initial upfront cost at about $220,000 for a Hypertruck ERX unit. What does that do for you? Okay, it, it does a lot of things. But for the cost of the RNG specifically compared to the diesel, remember the range, half of the cost of diesel and as little as one third the cost of diesel. The, these are huge, staunch differences. Okay. Now, over the course of that seven years with the Hypertruck ERX, it can be anticipated to run the fuel cost down to one third, okay, $94,000 instead of the $300,000. Now, these numbers are subject to change. And the real bet as a standalone is that perhaps maybe diesel falls to a dollar, okay? And then this comparison really falls on its ear. Because now the cost of RNG to diesel equivalent is, is, is equal, okay? And so the value proposition fades away. Is that possible with the fluctuation of fuel? I don't know. 
but that's really your call to make with regard to either drawing up a bearish thesis on whether or not the value proposition with Hylion is sustainable going forward. When you look at the uh, RNG cost to diesel equivalent, and right now there, there really is no comparisons and we can draw a, a staunch distinction between the two options, uh, as the cost savings over the life of that unit is drastically, drastically less. You're saving over $200,000 to run that Hypertruck ERX for seven years using the RNG. Now, is it worth it? Is it worth moving away from the reliability that we've had for decades with the fleets? This is where some of the hesitation comes from. Thomas Healy's talked about this many, many times. It, it's not an emotional decision. It is absolutely a business decision. These units are, for lack of better terms, tools within each of their fleets. It has to be anticipated that that truck will be able to, to run a, a number of road miles, gaining and garnering a, a level of payload that pays the unit back with some level of profitability and some level of reliability over the course of running that specific unit times whatever the uh, the fleet numbers have, whether it's a fleet of 10 or whether or not it's a fleet of a thousand, okay? You can exponentially figure this um, uh, uh, value proposition uh, by taking the value proposition on the bottom line and, and multiplying that by the, the number of fleets uh, uh, of rigs or units in the fleet. You can take that by the number or the percentage of some of these large fleets that want to start to integrate. That's where we can start to draw a, a, a nice value proposition for the Hylion story. When we start to look at comparing the fuel, the fuel is huge. The fuel cannot be overstated and it is absolutely worth talking about. If you're gonna take a position in this company, you have to understand the um, cost of RNG to the diesel equivalent, you have to. Now, the, the, the scary proposition, when you add this and layer this on top, understanding Hylion is a multifaceted, uh, ty type of application. You, you cannot look at it one-sided. You have to look at the pros and you have to look at the cons. But back to the fuel issue, if all things were, were equal and RNG was the exact same uh, to cost a, a gallon of diesel equivalent, would it, would it make sense for the fleets to transition? I contend no, it's not. The, avail the availability of fuel stations out there are prevalent. Diesel fuel is absolutely readily available, okay? Now, there are some truck drivers in the independent investor community that have given me some insights on the drawbacks and the damage, actually, from a mechanical perspective, that the DEF systems to try to filter off uh, some of those uh, NOx emissions uh, that come off of the tailpipe through uh, running the diesel engine, that it actually messes with the mechanics. And there are some costs to actually maintain the diesel down the line. I did not figure this in to my um, total cost of ownership, nor did I figure this into my value proposition. But I've had some thinking heads come back to me and say, no, no, Ryan, actually batteries are going to be easy to just plug and play, work, and then swap out. Uh, over the course of the life of the truck, very, very simple, very, very reliable, and actually could incur less headache um, using the internal combustion engine and the repairs that it could be subject to over that same time period, okay? But when we're talking about infrastructure, this is something that you will not hear Thomas Healy shy away from on any of the addresses that he makes to his audiences at the many forums that he attends. He talks about infrastructure as a big one. And you can talk all day about hydrogen fuel cell, okay? We're not gonna talk really about that as a value proposition here, because I think what's gonna end up happening as we trans uh, uh, evolve over the next 10 years, hydrogen fuel cell is gonna be more uh, part of the discussion but my thesis is we are being way too aggressive on the availability of hydrogen uh, as a fuel, okay? And it's not that it cannot be made, and it can, it, it's not that it cannot be delivered in concept. It can. But here's the thing. There are going to be equity players that step into all three phases. The middle phase is the one that I'm most interested in, and it is the transport of said hydrogen to the actual end fueling station. 
there are going to be, just like there are with diesel, the ability to transfer those from the storage units to the actual pumps where the, uh, the trucks can actually uh, refuel their trucks and, and continue on down their line. That infrastructure does not exist right now. And the real question that the bulls and the bears are deliberating on right now is the availability of said infrastructure and whether or not that infrastructure is going to come to fruition in the near future. I don't believe that it will. I believe that the stranglehold that diesel specifically, which Thomas Healy admitted was about 90% of the current fleet, is not going to go away so quickly. It is not going to be a, just a direct transfer of uh, a, a diesel fleet to a full electric fleet overnight. There, there's no way uh, a fully electric vehicle. It's just not going to happen that way. I believe that there's always going to be an application for diesel. And I, I find it hard to believe within the next two decades, 20 years, that we are looking at a total electrification of the long haul shipping uh, market. I just don't see that happening. And, and that's my realistic and plausible application when I look at what's going on in the class eight space. Okay. And we're looking at the um, um, value proposition of Hylion. When we talk infrastructure, infrastructure for RNG exists right now. So the question is, can I start to realize that bottom dollar benefit, not the holistic benefit, but the bottom dollar benefit when we talk about the value proposition surrounding fuel? That's it. The answer is yes. The answer is no when we talk about the other competitors, Tesla and Nikola specifically, who are offering fully electric trucks that, that are subject to the grid and the upfront cost for the technology. It just does not match up at all when you're talking about the value proposition there to going full electric. And I'll explain that a little bit more right now, because just like the hydrogen fuel cell infrastructure does not exist nor does the fully electric charging station infrastructure exist either, okay? Now, if you looked at it as a standalone and said, look, if we had charging stations all over this country, would fleets be more apt to take on a fully electric uh, type of fleet application for the long haul space? The scary answer to that question is no. And I don't think that people talk about this enough I don't think if they scrutinized the numbers, especially with Hylion, Hylion gets scrutinized and the stock is in the basement right now because of that scrutinization. But the comp competition out there, I don't think they get scrutinized at all on the numbers. I don't think there's a real question at all in what will this mean for the fleets? What will a, an all class eight Tesla future look like? What will an all um, um, uh, hydrogen fuel cell future look like uh, under an all Nikola future. Now, Thomas Healy is quick to address this and say, look, in an $800 billion addressable market, there's room for everybody. And I do believe that is true. I believe that the success of a Nikola is actually going to pay dividends for a Hylion. And a Hylion success is actually going to pay dividends for a potential application for a Tesla. And I think working together as the three main horses, Hyzon, I throw in that as well, the, the top four in the space looking to provide electric solutions, whether it be full electric solutions from the grid and or a hydrogen uh, fuel cell type of future and or a, a renewable natural gas type of future and application with what the uh, Hypertruck ERX offers with their electrified powertrains, I think it's gonna be a better future if all of these um, entities can succeed. It, it, seems, it seems like to me, the stock market is trying to pick winners right now uh, in the stock market. Hyzon is down in the fives. Hylion takes it on the chin for a while. Nikola takes it on the chin for a while. And, it, and it's really premature for any of these entities that we speak of on a frequent basis to be drawing those types of conclusions. The market will attempt to do that. That is the forward pricing mechanism of the stock market. And we will continue to do that as we start to price fluctuate and, and, and attempt to write in some of the lean, and I do mean lean fundamentals, having none of these companies ready for mass scale up 
and delivery at this point. When those metrics start to come in, we will have quantifiable information that we can what we can draw on, and you'll see that the stock price is a little bit more, um, a, a little bit less to such a volatile flux, fluctuations day to day, week to week. Okay, so when we're talking about the cost of RNG to the diesel equivalent, that is one of the many value propositions that we talk about, and it's one that the bulls and the bears need to consider when you're looking at. Uh, understanding a little bit more about what the highly on opportunity could mean in electrifying the class eight space. Number two is something that doesn't get talked about ever. It doesn't get talked about ever. It's not scrutinized in any of the panels at all. And I think this is key. And I, it's great that I can garner a fairly large audience because I really wish I heard a lot more people talk about this. I haven't heard a lot of the few channels that I really, really respect on highly on those that cover the company. And I know we're all aware of this, but I'm just going to put this out there, okay? The amount of payload that can be picked up on the Hypertruck ERX and then extended out for those seven years total cost of ownership it, it is actually adds $35,000 per unit to um, the amount of payload that can be hauled over the road. More payload equals more to the bottom line. And we will, when we look at how this compares to the electric solutions, this is daunting. And, and it's not so much that the $35,000 is such a huge deal. Bears will jump on this all day and say, big deal, Ryan. It's not a big deal. It is a big deal. But because when you draw a distinction between the Hypertruck ERX actually able to turn out a net positive gain on the payload, because the electrified powertrain solution is powerful, it actually adds more horsepower than a diesel. And with the, um, with the uh, lack of need to add a lot of weight to the Hypertruck ERX, it can actually haul that payload and really maximize that additional horsepower and torque that is existent in the Hypertruck. When we compare it to uh, the BEV fully electric from Tesla, when we compare it to the Nikola product, which is the hydrogen fuel cell uh, product, you actually lose $52,500 of payload capacity on the Nikola. Now, now, the value proposition cannot be understated here. Think about this for a second, guys. I'm giving you single unit numbers. Remember how I talked about the equation that is so, so important. If I'm sitting down and I'm trying to sell a fleet like Pepsi, it's very simple. How many trucks do you have in the fleet? What's the percentage of your desire to uh, step into the electrified powertrain solution, what, what, no matter what it is? When you cross compare the, um, uh, the options out there in the competitive landscape and you look at a Nikola product that loses 52,500 over that seven year period times the number of uh, proposed trucks that you're selling, I don't know why Nikola trades over $10 a share. As a matter of fact, the company with this value proposition, I just don't see it. Is the investment that you make in the Nikola product that is over $637,000 worth it if they're losing $52,500 in payload capacity over that time frame, time the number of fleets that you're looking to transition to hydrogen fuel cell? It just doesn't make any sense. Now, the scary proposition is that Hylion knows this about hydrogen fuel cell, and they talk about going fuel agnostic and then fully um, a, a hydrogen fuel cell into the future and being ready to do so on a moment's notice with no problem. We are not there. Now, whether or not this is available down the line, and I, I want to bring you back into the fairy tale world again, because Nicola seems to enjoy being in the fairy tale world most of the time. This is in a world where the infrastructure exists to where fleets can actually put hydrogen into these trucks to move their goods to lose 52,500 over the cost of, uh, of ownership over seven years. They are going to lose. Okay. Now, again, this isn't a fairy tale world because I'd like to bring you back to reality. This infrastructure does not exist as of now, and it will not exist for many, many years. It will not exist. They are dealing with a concept right now hoping that they can get the grant programs 
in place and the money to install the infrastructure. I just don't see that happening overnight. And my conviction is such to tell me that it's going to actually happen down the line, which is actually not as good for Hylion. Because if hydrogen fuel cell can come online within the next five to 10 years, I think Hylion stands to benefit from that. I absolutely do. But if hydrogen comes online 10 plus years from now, Hylion will not be able to benefit from that because it's just not going to be physically available. And I think fleets have already come to the rationalization that they cannot deploy in mass scale these hydrogen fuel cell trucks in their fleets when they know that they're going to lose on the payload because they're giving up on the horsepower and range. If you can't haul product as long as a diesel truck or a hyper truck ERX, you will lose. If you can't haul the weight, for that distance, you will lose, okay? And the, the equivalent bottom line factor to that is around $50,000 over the cost of owning that specific asset. Remember how I talked about the fleets looking at these as tools. The tools have to pay the entity back over time, okay? Now, when we look at fully electric, it's even worse, okay? It's even worse. They lose $140,000 of payload capacity over that seven years. It, how is that possible, Ryan? Well, it's possible in the numbers. And if you just sit back and think about it, you don't have to be an electrical grid expert to understand this, okay? I am not, but I understand this, okay? The problem with fully electric trucks, and there's talk about uh, the evolution of the battery getting smaller, being able to lower the charging times, this is all unproven technology at this point. There is still downtime of plugging into the grid. Is that enough standalone for fleets to say no to fully electric vehicles? I contend no. I contend no. I think the, 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 the interest in putting a Tesla truck in a fleet or 10 Tesla trucks for a specific application looks really, really good for a company. And I applaud those efforts. I absolutely do. But when you're losing $140,000 per unit for the payload capacity over the long haul because of their inability to go over a few hundred miles, I've seen 500 from the Hyzon product. It's the highest amount of miles to comparison to the ERX, which is rated at over 1,000 miles of range, okay? So 500 on the range. If they can't travel the distance and they're carrying more weight over that distance, it affects the ability for them to carry more payload, in fact, less payload, which cost the company in payload that would have otherwise been able to be transported, but they couldn't transport that cargo because they were instead hauling long batteries or large batteries to hold this charge to actually uh, propel the truck down the road in the first place. Okay. So Number two on the value proposition, which is really, really important to understand, is the payload. And I think the real takeaway here is not to look at the gained payload. It's impressive enough that you can go fully electric uh, solution with the Hypertruck ERX and gain 35,000 of payload capacity over the life of that. That's insane. It's sick. It's bullish. It's why I think this company's badass. That's why I love it. That's why I'm a bull in the company. That's why I'm invested in the company. Because when you start to look at these metrics, it's just not one metric standalone that's like, so what, Ryan? It's no big deal. Maybe as a standalone, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But when you look collectively at these comparative metrics, you really start to separate Hylion in their value proposition when compared to the industry out there. And I really want you to draw a distinction between the Hylion plus 35,000 to the plus side and the range of what they're giving up by that potential by opting for a Nikola product at giving up over 52,000 of payload and giving up the opportunity under the Tesla product of around $140,000. These are huge numbers, huge. No fleet out there is going to justify giving up 140000 per unit just for the sake of flying the Tesla flag. It's just not going to work. Fleets are smarter than that. They have to be able to take a product, validate it. And once they do, my bet is that they're going to validate this insofar as it will not be eligible to be introduced in certain services 
within fleets, especially on the long haul side. Now, I'm not saying that Tesla and Nikola are not going to win their contracts. I hope that they do, and I believe that they will. I, I believe that it's going to be incumbent upon the fleets to actually enjoy all of what is available via the technology out there, and then really put those to the rigor. And I'm not talking about a test and validation period of a couple months. I'm talking about actually buying the unit on the onset and really buying that as an investment to actually extrapolate the data from that investment and then make their business decisions going forward based on the hardline data that they've been able to discern for themselves, not from what Tesla projects, not from what Nikola projects, and, and, and also not what Hylion projects. I, I expect that these projections that uh, have been um, 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 uh, estimated through the release of these documents are going to be scrutinized and they are going to be validated no matter what fleet is doing the validation. Once those cross validations between fleets are made and they can really say, look, man, we're, we are really getting this payload increase. We are really getting this cost of ownership. And man, this is phenomenal. That RNG is really holding on. These new RNG facilities that are coming online is increasing the supply. It's increasing the demand as well, but the price actually is falling with the availability of RNG on the marketplace. Okay, we've actually got a benchmark to compare that to now uh, in the industry. Last thing I will say about the payload and the lack thereof is look again with the lack of infrastructure. If you're going to pick one word to invest in Hylion for, it is infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. It does not equate for the lack of infrastructure out there. And furthermore, the inability of even small hubs to be in, installed for these companies that are interested in providing for an all electric BEV solution in their fleets. And the municipalities are telling them no, because they will not permit the project. Even if they did, it would cost them $30 million. That's case in point, an example that's used all the time, where we talked about, you know, how hungry these companies are to electrifying their future uh, and looking to exploit some of these products and integrate them in their fleets. But the lack of infrastructure there, even in a perfect world where these charging stations existed everywhere and they could charge their trucks, what they would be doing is charging their trucks so they could lose 140,000 in payload capacity and, and a net loss when you compare the Tesla truck to the Hylion truck of, we're talking $175,000. That's a net loss in between that range compared head to head with Tesla and the Hypertruck ERX. Those are uncomparable numbers. You can't even put them in the same ballpark to say, uh, they're close enough, I'll opt for this one over here rather than this one. The one over here sells itself. It, it's just a bottom line decision. It's not an emotional decision. It's not, hey, I love the look of the Tesla truck. Like I said, these fleets don't give a shit how the truck looks. They don't care. I think drivers do. I think they do. And I think if you look at the Hypertruck ERX and you compare it to the Tesla uh, uh, BEV vehicle, I, I laugh every time I look at it. I would feel bad for a truck driver if my fleet gave me uh, the, the, the opportunity to drive one of these ugly Bev trucks and said, here you go. You're going to be the laughing stock of all the people out there driving big badass diesels still to this day and also driving the badass Hypertruck ERX, man. If you're going to tell me that aesthetics don't matter, I beg to differ. But for the fleet owners itself, it's the bottom line performance that matters, okay? If it looks ugly as hell, but that bottom line performance is there, they'll go for the ugly as hell, no doubt about it. In that capacity, I think Tesla and Nikola both have a lot, a lot of work. The question that I get posed with all the time, and this is value proposition number three, is, is going green worth it? After all of the discussion about the value proposition on the top side with the fuel and the payload capacity, you ask the question, is going green as a standalone entity worth it? You know, there's going to be a lot of people out there that want me to say, yeah, it's worth it. From a business perspective, it's not. Now, now, now let me tell you, let me quantify that a little bit. My own personal answer is hell yes. It's absolutely worth it. I think these fleets have got away with polluting the world for, for long enough. And I think they understand that there is a little bit of a stewardship 
type of initiative behind this green type of movement to improve where it is that they can improve uh, insofar as not compromising their businesses. In other words, it doesn't do any good to go green if they can't make a profit by doing so. It, it will be a futile effort. In, in other words, the company will cease to exist. There will be supply chain issues. People will not get their goods delivered. And over the road trucks is how our goods are delivered. We, we, we don't want to compromise that supply chain and how important and vital that is for the transportation system. Very, very important. But is going green worth it? Let me offer a few of these perspectives. When you couple them with the aforementioned fuel savings and the payload, it, it starts to become very, very crystal clear that going green is absolutely worth it. But here's some of the intangibles that are not being really talked about too much. There's not only a demand from the general public to say, look, maybe it's time to look at the potential for reducing carbon emissions within fleets, okay? Now, think about a fleet like Budweiser, for example, Anheuser-Busch, that is looking to electrify their fleets. It was named as one of the top stewards uh, for invent environmental initiatives within their fleet. Very, very important to them, okay? But think about the ability to fly the green flag to their customers, the customers that they deliver to who are demanding that them on the uh, production and transportation side deliver a product and do so in the cleanest method possible, okay? Right now, they're not doing that. Is there a value proposition that exists in that? Is there a potential that businesses could look at businesses that are taking these green initiative steps and starting to provide some of the tailwind in the industry and start to really provide some of the examples uh, to some of these fleets that are maybe lagging behind in taking on some of these green initiatives, taking on some of these initial costs at the onset with the hope that they can validate that the bottom line is there. And I believe that they will. But, but remember when I talked about the, dis, the di, uh, disconnect from the old reliability to, to the prospects of the new technology as they step into uh, the prospects of the new technology, okay? So when we're talking about green as a standalone, there's a lot of questions that I get all the time. Ryan, is highly on really worth it? Is this green initiative kind of a, is it a pipe dream? You know, it, it, is it really worth it? Why don't, why don't fleets just stay with the diesel and just continue to run diesel for the next 50 years? I think that coupled with the other uh, value propositions that I talked about really help answer that question for you guys. And they get the whole kit and caboodle. They can be on the front uh, edge of the wave. What if some of these bottom line validations prove out? What if the payload is increased? What if the bottom line is actually increased and you can actually realize a total cost of ownership that is significantly less than diesel and significantly less than a, a full BEV option with all of the hurdles that they have and also a hydrogen fuel cell future. If they can start to quantify those on a per unit vehicle, then that's when the validation and the ramp up to mass scale starts to happen when they start to introduce the factors of the percentage of the fleet that they want to electrify within their fleets. I don't care if they've got 10,000 trucks. The math is still the same. It doesn't matter. Okay. We want to do 10% this year, Thomas Healy. Okay. No problem. Sit down. What does that render? That renders X number of trucks. That renders uh, X number of e uh, ERXs coming off the line. It renders this bottom line total cost of ownership. Then you run the cross comparison with diesel. It's going to blow it out of the water, guys. It's scary. And that's where the value proposition lies, okay? When you start to look at this thing holistically, which you have to do, you cannot just look at this and say, the stock is low, I'm going to buy it. That, that, that just means nothing. You, you cannot... You cannot look at this company that way. You have to look at the granular details. You have to look at the value proposition in the avenue that they're going in and understand it in its totality and understand what this could mean for the fleets in going down the checkbox and saying, yes, it checks this box. Yes, it checks this box. And those are the, the, the scrutinizing elements that the fleets are 
going to run each and every one of these companies through when they're looking to accept uh, a, a certain number of these vehicles into their fleet, all right? The last couple things that I will mention here in the value proposition, do you stay with diesel? Um, is it a harder truck to drive? Is it loud? Does it create health issues? Um, is it difficult to drive? How much easier is it uh, to drive the Hypertruck ERX? I'm getting some filters of some information to me to, 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 to lead me to believe that the Hypertruck ERX is a dream to drive. It's on full electric, it's, it's silent. Imagine driving a semi, something that big, and having it roll down the road silent. Now, I don't know. I would love to hear this from truck drivers. I'm not a truck driver, nor do I presume to uh, imply that it's going to be an easier drive or a more difficult drive. But some of the feedback that we're getting from some of the early stage testimonials from the drivers is nothing but, but positive, that it's fabulous. Coupled with the onboard navigation system and the fact that each of these trucks uh, provide about a gigabyte of data per day that can be used, sent to the cloud, extrapolated, sent back to the actual fleet owner, uh, allowing them to maybe forecast when some of the uh, preventative maintenance is due before you have maybe even a catastrophic breakdown that could have been prevented uh, through forecasting of a temperatures, onboard monitoring system, driver tendencies, et cetera, capturing that data. The real value proposition here, uh, along one of many different value propositions with Hylion, is their ability to provide that as a service. So software as a service back to their clients to kind of allow them to proactively manage their fleet rather than uh, run on a, a maintenance schedule, okay, which is what uh, an internal combustion engine runs on, um, just running uh, those on a maintenance schedule based on no real data except for what has historically worked and what is in accordance with the, with the manufacturer's recommended uh, type of maintenance schedule on those said products, the mechanics, the electrical systems that, uh, that uh, are, are involved in these trucks. But it'd be amazing to take all this data and have the algorithms crunch that data and, and provide a real resource report back to the companies. And this is something that Sherry Baker talked about on the last Barclays uh, um, um, Q&A session. That was the most recent information that's been released. If you are interested in Hylion at all, I highly recommend you catch that Q&A. It is very telling. You have to pay attention. You have to really, really listen to the answers, listen to the questions that are being asked, and you'll get a real snapshot on where Hylion is at this current juncture. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the video. Leave your comments at the bottom here. Always trying to keep the freaking discussion going on this topic, guys. I will continue to fight, no doubt about it. If you're cold, naked, shivering in a corner right now and hungry because you think that the stock is so depressed that it'll never go up, think about the value proposition. Think about the shares that you own. The shares do not change. And the value of the shares at any given time is not indicative of where that value proposition will land the value of those shares into the future. Guys, subscribe to the channel. Share the message with anybody out there that you know covers highly on. The information is right now scarce on the landscape. That way you're getting my best shot at being aggressive in being forward in trying to uncover the value proposition with this incredible, incredible company and more so the incredible opportunity that exists with the stock. Guys, thank you so much for tuning into the message and good luck in your investment future. Thank you.